I will persist until I succeed. <clears throat> These words were written by a gentleman called Ogmandino. Some of you may know of him already, as he was later dubbed the greatest salesman in the world. I came across his writings during my early years in college, but little did I know how much of an impact it would have on my life years later. When I was asked to give this talk, I was excited but apprehensive at the same time. Partly because healthcare had been in the center of the political controversy for so long. And, I, you know, at the time, the Affordable Care Act rollout had flopped. The government shutdown had happened, and I said, there is no way people would want to hear about healthcare. Growing up in a third world country where most people don't even have the basic access to healthcare, I couldn't understand, though, why we were living in one of the greatest, richest countries of the world. But yet, people, people were so frustrated with the healthcare system. I'm here to share with you how through our enactment, we're getting people excited about their health again. But before I do that, let me take you on a journey. My story starts where I grew up in Sierra Leone. <clears throat> Whenever I speak about Sierra Leone, most people remember it as the country that was stricken with a 10-year civil war in the 1990s with scenes of mutilation and acts of violence that most people couldn't even fathom. Prior to that, it was a peaceful, democratic country with pristine coastline and bright hopes. Since the war, Sierra Leone has been ranked as one of the poorest countries in the world. Nonetheless, one of my earliest memories was growing up in my childhood home on Bowling Street, which was in a part of the capital free town called King Tom. What, let me paint a picture for you. What shaped the course of my life was that this particular home was about 100 yards away from the entrance to a very large cemetery. This picture shows the proximity of my home to the cemetery, and this was taken about two weeks ago. What most people wouldn't understand is that these funeral processions are usually on foot and not the vehicular convoys as we have them today. What that means is we got to recognize the familiar solemn march as the procession made its way towards my house. My sister and I would rush to the front of the house, would peer through the windows, and would witness the singing, the weeping, the wailing of the mourners. And this I later came to understand was the reality for the loved ones, the finality of life as they started to approach the gates of the cemetery. Well, as you can imagine, as a six-year-old child, that stuck with me. And I remember starting to ask the questions about why, but mostly about death and why. I also remember innocently at that age deciding that I wanted to make an impact and change why people die. And maybe I can alleviate the pain that I, and suffering that I remember on the faces of the mourners as they walked past my house. Anyway, we would later move away from that home to another part of town. But I would return years later back to that same neighborhood to attend the Prince of Wales School, which was in that neighborhood. It was there, in this, in this halls, during the formative years of my life, that I developed this profound love for art and design. With my parents' encouragement and support, I pursued art intently to the extent it became a large part of who I was. So they, in fact, I even entertained the idea of studying architecture in college. I would later move to the U.S. with architecture on my mind, but I decided to go into medical school. You see, I had some unfinished business. I had made a promise as a child watching out that window years earlier, and I wanted to follow through. So I ended up going to medical school. I started my career, and I understood that these two worlds of medicine, fine art, and architecture did not necessarily coexist as they're usually separate disciplines, right? But I was determined that if I was gonna do medicine, by golly, art was coming with me. So I developed this niche of starting and managing medical practices, but I relegated my love for art to just being represented on the walls of the healthcare space. But as I, my career took off, I saw how we, my medicine sort of took me on this path that it pushed me farther and farther away from who I was as an artist and I started to realize I was losing a piece of myself. Of course, people hasten to point out that these two worlds, art and medicine, are usually mutually exclusive, except when using the, in the cliche, the art of medicine, right? Well, I'm here to contend that medicine is art. Let me explain. When a person walks through the door as a patient, they're represented by a piece of art that has been years in the making. 
I'm sure we'll all agree that a baby born a few hours ago is a miracle and a pure work of art. But as we age and mature, our art starts to evolve. Then come the emotional and physical ailments, the bruises and the scrapes, and that starts to define our life art, as it were. We all know each piece of art has a story, and just for that moment, just for that moment, these patients get to share their stories with us. As a physician, I hold that dear, and just like everyone else that they come in contact with in their lifetime, as a healer and, as, and an artist, I also get to participate in refining and defining that evolving art. Even the process of surgery is art. It's the process of sculpting and putting things back together so people can go on to share their life art with the world. I guess what I'm trying to say is we as physicians get to put a brush stroke of paint on that art. So the next time you hear the phrase, he's a piece of work, <laughs> it'll have a totally set of meaning for you. Remember this? I will persist until I succeed. Well, I was hell-bent on fusing, marrying, merging my worlds of art and medicine if I was going to be totally fulfilled. So I set off on a quest. I set out to create an art gallery that could attend to patients rather than a medical clinic with art on the walls. And that led to the birth of the healthcare gallery. So I started off with an art gallery footprint and worked my way backwards to incorporate medicine into the space with the idea, the deliberate intent, that medicine was always going to take a backseat to the art, rather than the way it's always been in my life, which is art was going to take, was always took, uh, medicine took over um, art. Well, anyhow, what I ended up creating was this art-centric space, so much so that when you walked in, it had no semblance to a traditional medical clinic. I feel that a well-designed, well-executed healthcare facility in your local neighborhood makes you feel calm and more in control of your health. Especially as it is in these environments, you will spend a considerable amount of face-to-face -face time with your doctor discussing matters related to your health. So people ask me, how did you get this done? Well, the biggest challenge for me was redefining the space where healthcare can be, def can be delivered with cost in mind. Because I realized if I could redefine the space, then I could change the environment, right? There has been some benefits to doing this, but I can assure you it's not financial. In fact, I hold the belief that art should be shared, and I'm proud to say that with the exception of minor expenses for art upkeep, the proceeds of the sale of each piece of art goes directly to the artist. So that's not been the benefit. The benefit has been this, however. We all know that hotel reviews play a large part in determining, changing our perception and our decision whether we stay in one hotel versus the other. Well, there's a growing trend of online physician review websites that patients are turning to. While they may assess the ease of appointments, the waiting room times, the physician's personal delivery, we all know how the built environment, the actual physical space, how that affects one, how one feels when walking away from a doctor's appointment. So that has been the benefit, but critics hasten to point out, so that's well and good, you've redefined the space, you've reconfigured the workflow, but how does this address the issue of the rising cost of healthcare and what we're getting for that cost, namely the outcomes? Well, I'm here to say that the overwhelming consensus from our patients is that they've never felt more engaged with their health and now they're motivated to stay healthy, which will change the outcomes. It's been a win-win for all, but most importantly, I have to sh say that I wanted to set a new standard for the art of healthcare, not just for myself, but for my colleagues. The idea was that if we can get people healthy and motivated to stay healthy, we can give them a better quality of life, and maybe we can delay that finality of life that we all have to face. So I'm here to share, share that the most important thing I've learned in all of this is that though your ideas may be far-fetched, just like mine was, if I persist long enough, I will win. How did I know this? Because the words of the greatest salesman of the world resonated with me way back in college. 
he goes on to write in the scroll, for so long as there is breath in me, that long will I persist. For now, I know one of the greatest principles of success. If I persist long enough, I will win. I will persist, I will win, and you can too. Thank you.